and let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another one of our thematic webinars for the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge. Today, we'll be hearing about innovative thinking from one of our industry partners, uh, Sridhar Diptak, an innovator in his own right. Uh, before we begin, I just want to go over our usual housekeeping. I'm recording this webinar and its transcript, which will be available online. If you do not wish to be recorded, please turn off your video and or mute yourself. And uh, we'll share the recording and slides with you following the event on the CrowdSold event forum page. So when you're not asking a question, please mute yourself to avoid any distractions. Here is the agenda today. Um, if you haven't already seen in the waiting room, we have a Mentimeter poll going around that I hope you can all fill out. Um, so if you haven't done it already, I'll be sharing the link on the next slide. If you're watching the recording immediately after the event, please feel free to fill them out as you go along, and I can include them with the post-event materials, all of our answers together. Um, so as you know, we've changed our webinar format. Rather than straight presentations, we'll be hearing a short introductory presentation from our speaker, followed by the bulk of the session dedicated to a panel discussion and Q&A. So if you follow through um, our Mentimeter, you can submit questions to the Q&A at any time. Alternatively, you can raise your hand or put your questions in the chat any, at any time as well. Um, yeah, so I encourage you not to wait for the dedicated Q&A period. As, uh, as soon as one comes to you, just feel free to share it. Um, I'll try to integrate them throughout the session. Okay, so this is our Mentimeter. You can follow uh, and go on menti.com, fill in this code or follow the QR code. I'll leave this on the screen for just a moment. Um, so it will just ask you for a couple of one word answers. And this is just useful for us to understand where we're all coming from and uh, begin reflecting on the subject at hand. So let me just leave this up for another second. Um, menti.com and then it's just this code. I'll also put the link to voting in the chat. And we'll go over the responses in just a moment. Okay. Uh, while you're going through that, uh, please let me introduce you to our speaker. So Silard Liptak, um, as you all have seen from the invite, Silard is the CTO of AgSol, a solar agro-processing startup. Before AgSol, he worked in eight countries on four continents, including Georgia Tech's Center for Distributed Energy, where he worked on the tech to market transfer of ultra low cost technologies designed specifically for the developing world. Uh, Silard leads Axel's technology platform and is based in Nairobi, Kenya with his family. So I'm sure you'll hear, uh, learn a bit more about Silard during his presentation, um, but that's to come. Hopefully you've all had a little bit of time to fill in a Mentimeter. Um, if not, we'll also be sharing this in the, in the post event. But what do you, let's see, the question was, um, what word comes to mind when you think of innovation? Um, and we have improved a unique idea and transformation. I think basic idea coming through, um, people understanding what, what they believe innovation to be. And I guess we'll see what, if CLARD kind of contradicts that or uh, where we go from here. Um, oops, there we go, betterment coming up as well. Coming to the side, little cloud. Creativity coming out as well. Okay. Um, so you have your presentation. Do you wanna go through that on your screen? I can stop sharing and hand over to you. Sure, let me try. All right, and share sound. Yes. Optimize for video clip. Yeah, let's try that. Here we go. All right, can you guys see my screen all right? Yep, can see it great. All right, sweet. So yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sean, for, for inviting me. Uh, as as he said, my name is Silard Liptak. I'm the, the CTO of uh, AgSol, the solar agro-processing startup. Uh, I'm hoping that during this uh, presentation, the gods of the internet will be you know, very cooperative, and uh, I hope that uh, the internet connection is gonna hold up despite you know our our Kenyan <laughs> challenges. 
um yeah if if sean if there are you know if i'm coming across spotty or anything you know let me know and i'm happy to repeat uh, anything um so today i'm going to talk about uh, innovative thinking um you know uh from my perspective uh, i'm going to share with you uh, a little bit about ourselves you know what is axel what do we do uh then i'm going to go a little bit into you know what my thinking is about uh, how innovation applies specifically to product design, uh, product development, and uh, product startups, tech startups more broadly. Uh, and uh, then eventually going to share a bit of a personal story of uh, how we went about the the first version of the micro meal, uh, aka what not to do. So <laughs> hopefully you guys will learn from our mistakes and won't repeat the same same ones. So, um, as a bit of a kickoff, um, there we go. Uh, as a kickoff, I just want to start with, uh, you know, a uh, bit of a sobering truth. Uh, there are no silver bullets. There are no simple solutions. There are no geniuses sitting in an ivory tower ideating about the, the future of mankind and coming off with grand ideas that changes everything. Uh, I strongly believe all innovation happens in the midst of things. <laughs> As uh, Thomas Edison said, a genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And I uh, very strongly agree with, uh, with this notion. Uh, you have to have a spark of an idea, but uh, that spark won't be coming, you know, just uh, in and of itself. It, it does need a very fertile breeding ground where it can uh, be conceived and where it can grow into something you know useful for hopefully the wider society uh, such as a such as a business so a little bit about us um i think <laughs> this audience doesn't need introduction that uh, uh, one billion people have no access to electricity and the overwhelming majority of these people are farmers they are living in rural areas, uh, you know, poorly developed grids, poorly developed water utilities, poorly developed infrastructure, broadly speaking. And uh, these farmers depend on agriculture for their livelihood. And uh, they are extremely underserved, not just by public utilities, but also by private services, including uh, agro-processing. So without further ado, let's just see what is the state of the art today? So what you're seeing here is uh, a diesel mill. So it is what you see on the left side is the mill itself. On the In the middle of the screen is a diesel engine. It's an Indian made diesel engine. I believe the nameplate said it was made in 1987. So this engine is older than I am. <laughs> and still running somewhat miraculously. Uh, and what you see on the on the right side is, uh, is a cyclone. It's something to separate the two. So let's just see how people are processing their, their food today. So let me just play this video. Hopefully it will be visible on your side. So these machines are hand crank. Hopefully you can hear the beautiful sound. These machines make. They have incredibly good power, incredibly high. The weather is out of the Just despite the fighting of the future, despite of expertise. But quite smelly. In there, the power that comes out does smell. magic that even I'm not sure about what, what it exactly means. Uh, the engine has a big uh, cooling barrel that's not visible on the on the video uh, so that water can run through it and cool it. Um, and as all diesel engines, as you guys probably seen in cars, uh, require oil changes, requires oil filter changes. Uh, the spare parts are incredibly difficult to come across in, in rural Africa and uh, they break down very often so yeah why are people using such an extremely outdated and unsuitable technology 
uh, because there is no better alternative. You know, if you don't have a grid, if you don't have an electric motor to turn it, well, this is the solution. And it's been the solution for 100 years. And um, as you guys, I'm, I'm sorry, Sean, just checking the audience are engineering students or other students as well? Uh, we have a few others, but the far majority are engineering students. Okay. So as the engineers in the audience, you know, are aware of, uh, it's a really outdated <laughs> technology, incredibly inefficient, incredibly expensive to operate, especially in rural areas where the cost of diesel is very high. Um, so let's see what we can do. Um, maybe we can do something that's better. So this meal, as you will see on the, on, in, on the next slide, is uh, something that you can hold uh, in your hands, <laughs> quite quite opposite the other one. Uh, it is specifically designed to run on solar power. Okay, so we made the mill very, very high efficiency. And uh, thanks to that efficiency, you know, the mill itself is more expensive, but the cost of the entire system is much lower because you can reduce the size of the solar system tremendously. So we are able to power it purely from solar, it is incredibly easy to operate. There is a single button on it, but you need to push to turn it on. No hand crank, no physical strength required. It's not considered a man's job to, to operate this mill. Um, um, and once it finishes milling, it turns off automatically. Uh, it is cheaper than a diesel or an AC equivalent mill. Uh, needless to say, it does not consume fuel. So once it's installed, it is the it is uh, incredibly price competitive. Uh, it is two and a half times more efficient than any other electric meals. And what enables all these benefits is uh, uh, a new novel technology, uh, novel <laughs> half a century old only, uh, called brushless DC motors or BLDC motors. Uh, these are very smart motors that uh, are incredibly high efficiency, incredibly high power density, have no moving parts other than the bearings. And uh, the downside is that they require more smarts, specifically an electronic controls that's spinning this motor. But in exchange for, for that, you know, we get a machine that's uh, very, very uh, user friendly and uh, takes care of itself, you know, has a lot of protections that conventional meals don't do. And it even has something that, uh, that no other meal out there has completely self feeding. So the user doesn't need to stand there and regulate the flow of material. It can just simply dump the material, turn it on and walk away, not having to do anything else. So let's see it in action instead of me talking. So I'm just gonna play this video if uh, there we go. So this is the automatic mechanism in action. Our quality was before Tunga, the Kenyan human consumable power. It's very easy to open up, very easy to clean, something that conventional machines are not particularly good at. You can change over to a variety of other finest like chicken and beef. It's available both in solar format, AC format, that is power format. So that's our product. Um, I, I think I can very proudly say that uh, all other solar machines out there, oops, sorry. Uh, I can proudly say that all other solar machines out there typically cost more than the incumbent that they are replacing. In our case, the incumbent is so outdated and so ripe for disruption that we actually can do something that nobody else can. We are cheaper on capex on upfront costs than uh, the incumbent technology. And then once you own it, of course, there is no fuel cost. So then it becomes significantly uh, more cheap because 
these OMEOs typically spend um, forty-five percent of their uh, revenue on diesel, so it's a it's a not very profitable business. All right, so you know that's our product. You know, on a on a very high level. Uh, if there are further questions, I'm very happy to uh, to go into to more details. Uh, if you guys are interested, please check out our website exol.com and you can read more about the product and about our team. Um, but jumping into more broadly the uh, innovation, uh, actually, before I go there, uh, does anybody have any questions right now from the top of your heads before before I move on? All right. I take that as a no. Nope. Um, so just confirming, can you see the top of the screen as well? Is the Zoom uh, panel? kind of blocking we're, it out or? we're losing a little bit of that first line otherwise we can see it a little bit of the first one all right uh, hi floating meeting controls there we go is it better <laughs> uh, actually another window has appeared in front, of, in front of it there we go now it's better there we go all right so jumping into innovation uh, so to be Completely honest, I was I was a bit confused <laughs> when when Sean asked me. Uh, I I didn't quite uh, feel like a, you know like a creative person. <laughs> I I felt like that. Well, I'm finding creative solutions, but <laughs> I did not quite identify as one. And um, you know, one one quote that uh, you know popped in my mind that I think describes the situation very well is uh, creativity is just connecting things. Uh, from Steve Jobs. Then he went on saying that when you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seemed obvious to them after a while. So I, that's pretty much my philosophy as well <laughs> when it comes to creativity. Uh, you have to be on top of your game. You have to know a variety of things. But uh, once you know those things, it's only a matter of connecting things. So specifically, the two areas that I want to uh, highlight are engineering first principles and knowing your customer. So what I've been my engineering first principles. Um, if you've been unlucky, just like me, who received a not so excellent engineering education, uh, you may have received a very superficial view of things. Uh, you know, hey, a transformer is a black box that transforms one kind of electricity to another. Uh, all these uh, power electronic appliances are just magic that, you know, randomly make things work. Um, I don't know, brushless DC motors are just another kind of electric motor. It's uh, a bit better than the old ones, but hey, I mean, yeah, it's not much of a difference. Um, and that's lethal. <laughs> so I cannot cannot really sugarcoat it much more. Um, if you want to be able to do engineering innovation, you have to really know engineering. You really have to know the first principles that are driving these designs. You really have to know the difference between these. And uh, if you've been unlucky just like me, uh, then you know what I can um, recommend is that hey, you are the master of your own destiny. Um, grab online courses, really brush up on the fundamentals, and all the rest just naturally falls out. Um, so as for myself, you know I can I, I did take online courses from MIT. Uh, and I pushed to uh, complete my my masters in in a in a better uh, in a better environment. I, I was privileged enough to receive a scholarship to the U.S., where I feel like my my engineering uh, skills were <laughs> improved uh, tremendously. Uh, and I cannot emphasize the importance of this enough. Do not reason by analogy. Analogy is like well, it's something like this other thing. And that never works. You have to understand the first principles. Why and how is it different? You have to challenge assumptions. You know, everybody knows that lithium ion batteries are more expensive than lead acid batteries, except when they are not. You know, these kind of uh, high level superficial assumptions are really holding by design. And I'm going to come back in our, 
in our own experience, how these assumptions were holding back uh, product development in this area. Another one is knowing physical limitations. You know, one side is know what is possible, but the other side is know what is impossible. I, I think I don't need to tell the, the stories of, uh, of recent startups, but that have been overly uh, ambitious in their, in their goals and uh, have just not respected the, the laws of nature <laughs> that cannot be broken. Uh, and uh, you have to know what, how to navigate this world. As an engineer, your job in an organization to interface between the human world, what people want, and the physical world, what is possible. And you are the expert to translate those, those needs to, um, to designs, to implementations. Uh, and what you want to do is be a lazy engineer. You always want to find the easiest solution <laughs> that works, gets the job done, simplest and cheapest. So yeah, feel free to, to drive for laziness. <laughs> and speaking of uh, interfacing with humans, uh, the second key thing that I would like to emphasize is knowing your customer. I cannot emphasize the importance of that. Uh, you know, hit up any modern books about startups or product development, and this is where it all, all begins. Um, we as engineers tend to be a bit more, uh, how, to, how to say it, a bit more shy, uh, maybe a bit more, uh, you know, restrained from just going out and talking to customers, but uh, I'm afraid there is no easy way out of this, and <laughs> there is only way to really know your customer is to meet them and to talk to them. Uh, like I said at the beginning, it is impossible to innovate in a vacuum. Uh, believe me, I tried. It's a really bad idea. Um, you, you have to know the tiniest details of a customer's needs. And when you don't and you make assumptions, those assumptions basically always turn out to be wrong. Um, one of one of the one of the advices that uh, I've read in the book uh, Lean Startup that I'm a strong proponent of is that whenever you make an assumption and whenever you put a number down in an Excel sheet that you know you assume to be right, make sure to mark it red, make it bold, make it stand out, put a ton of exclamation marks around it because that one number can screw up your design and in a broader sense can undermine the fundamentals of your business. So always know what your assumptions are and always strive to validate them as soon as possible. And uh, finally, my one of my favorite quotes, <laughs> this, this presentation is quite heavy in, in quotes, as you can see, um, is coming from Henry Ford. And he said, if I listen to my customers, uh, sorry, if I had asked my customers, they would have said, they want a faster horse. So, you know, it is important to listen to them, but don't always do what they tell you. Okay, you as an engineer, again, is the interface between the human world and the natural world. You can translate the customer needs into a design that fulfills their needs. Okay, uh, they don't need a faster horse, they need a car. <laughs> and just like our customers, they don't need a cheaper diesel meal. They need a completely different kind of meal. Um, so with that, uh, I'm really hoping you guys have come across the, the Lean Design methodology or the, the Lean Startup book, one way or the other. Uh, if you haven't, I, I strongly, strongly recommend to, you know, Google it, hit it up, buy the book, read it. It's, uh, it's uh, really the, the, you know, state of the art way of, uh, of making new uh, ideas come to life. Uh, but if you haven't, I'm just quickly going to give you a, a two minute crash course on one of the one of the main ideas. Uh, and uh, that is that where you start with an idea, you got to build a product. And for that idea, you do need an in depth knowledge of the customer and their goals and a very, very desperate need that they have that you are aiming to solve. So build a product. But again, don't spend too much time on it. Okay, what you want to shoot for in the first iteration is something quick, something easy. It doesn't have to be perfect. It has to show the main functionality 
we call it a minimum viable product or MVP. Then once you have it, you need to measure how that product is performing. If there are any features that's taking time to develop or to maintain or cost a single cent that is not contributing to the success of the product, you need to cut it out. If there is any feature that the customer needs and can be improved on, even if it's expensive but worth the cost, you need to make better. And the only way you can tell the difference between the two is by measuring. And here comes the most important part. You need to learn and you need to go back and iterate. Iterate, iterate, iterate. And you have to do it fast. You have to minimize the time through the loop. And you have to quickly complete this build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn loop as quickly as possible. Because your first step at it, let's be honest, is not going to be great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just reiterating my, my previous point that the first assumptions are never right, uh, that is seen everywhere. Okay, that's not just in the off-grid solar sector that, you know, as software, as hardware, everywhere. Um, you know, Airbnb is called Airbnb because it stood for air bed and breakfast. It was originally made so that you put up an air bed in your room and uh, people can just come fresh at your place and pay you something. Today, people are building houses specifically to be put on Airbnb. Facebook started out as uh, something where you can, you know, keep touch with your college buddies. Um, you know, it grew to be something much, much, much more different. And um, same with our product. Our, our first assumptions were, were wrong. And, uh, you know, we paid the price for it. And uh, the only way to really resolve that is to know your customer and to know your customer, know your tech and iterate quickly. So uh, some good notes before I move on to our personal story. Um, I'm going to make it pretty blunt. Uh, patents in our industry are dead. If you are hoping you can you know, uh, come up with a good idea, patent it, and uh, live from it for the rest of your life, that may work in uh, nice closed systems like the US or within China or within the EU. But in an international environment like we are operating in, you know, typically uh, the developing world, um, they don't provide a lot of protection. Uh, you can uh, patent your design, uh, but you have to pick uh, a geographic uh, location. Like, do you patent it in Kenya? That doesn't give you protection in Uganda. You patent it in Kenya, Uganda, doesn't help with China. You patent it in China as well, doesn't help you with India. So you would have to have a very elaborate patent strategy and a very expensive one to implement that, or just have to accept the reality that uh, patents don't give protection. Even if you have a patent that only gives you a ticket to sue someone, but it does not cover, you know, it doesn't automatically yield results. It doesn't automatically a guarantee that you come out winning and it's a very routine uh, tactic by incumbents to start startups of cash by simply suing them um so unfortunately patents are not going to be your friend in this industry you have to out innovate your competition you just always have to maintain your edge and always be six months to a year ahead of them that's the only way to to stay in business the other one I want to mention is innovation risk management. You know, we engineers love innovation. We love creativity and we love cool features. And so do I. <laughs> but you have to know that every time you come up with a new innovation, you are introducing risk. And that risk has to be balanced. So always, whenever you brainstorm about a really cool new feature, always weigh it against reliability. How much, how can it break? How does it affect your core product functionality? And you have to introduce these changes um, gradually, and you have to be very careful about uh, how you're going about them. Um, and the last one is just generally, hey guys, be informed. You know, know your customers, know your tech, that's for sure, but know your business and know your industry. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. 
you know, business is a collaborative art. You, if somebody has already figured something out and willing to, you know, provide that product or service, don't try to do it by yourself. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, you know, work with others, know what others have done, know how they succeeded or didn't with that and know how you're different. So you're not making the same mistakes. So with that, I'm just looking at the time. Uh oh, I will have to <laughs> speed up a bit. Uh, let me tell the first story of how we developed our our first micro meal. Uh, so as you can see in the in the in the bottom left corner, it looked quite different from from what you've seen on the on the video. It, it's quite it's much bigger. It's much more expensive and much slower than our current version. And uh, we made a number of mistakes that begin the book <laughs> during the development. Um, so, you know, starting from the top left, uh, we started saying, we know what the customer wants. We don't need to go out and talk to them. There is this report from the World Bank. There is that report from WFP. There are all these reports out there that very smart people wrote. Surely they must be right. Second-hand information is as good as first. And why spend any time talking to pesky customers in dirty environments? That's no fun. Engineering is fun. So we said, hey, we know what the customer wants. We don't need to waste any time with, with talking with them. And hey, what they want is a, a meal that can replace a diesel meal. Check mark. So we went into the technical design straight away. Um, a lot of technical um, skepticism came up, like what I mentioned, that, uh, hey, we need an affordable machine. We need to make the machine cheap. That's a bad idea. <laughs> what you need to make sure is that the whole system is cheap. If the machine is cheap, but it takes a $2,000 battery to run, it's not going to be an affordable machine. Another one is that a bearing can take a 12,000 RPM direct drive meal that's too fast and they will break. Um, again, engineering fundamentals. Why? I mean, conventional meals out there do use banks that can survive this. So why would that possibly be a problem? Why would direct drive be a problem other than a massive gain in efficiency? So when it comes to uh, technical doubters, and I can guarantee you, you will come across them. Uh, don't be afraid, you know, go back to engineering fundamentals, see if it makes sense. And if the nature allows you to do something, then go ahead and do it. Don't, don't spend time with your, with your doubters. And another early skepticism was we cannot use lithium ion batteries, they are too expensive. Well, I mean, true on a per watt hour basis, but again, if you go back to engineering fundamentals, the C rating is much higher. So you can run a machine on a much smaller lithium ion battery than you would need uh, a lead acid battery for. So basically you can, instead of spending $2,000 on a battery bank, you can spend $200 on a battery bank that can both power your machine and use a more expensive technology. So again, superficial knowledge is a killer always know the first principles. Um, so we started doing, you know, specification creation in a vacuum. I was sitting in China at the time, coming up with ideas, what Kenyan farmers need, because I, I surely know what those guys need. I've lived in Malawi, you know, I've lived next to a posho mill, it's fine. And we came up with the idea that, hey, I mean, how many hours would these guys run a meal? Uh, eight? Eight, eight, eight sounds like a good number, eight, eight hours, yeah. So let's say they are running it eight hours a day. And when are they milling? Um, I mean, they're not milling at night, it would be dark. So they're milling when the sun is shining. I mean, that's what a meal is good for, right? I mean, a solar meal makes perfect sense. So these two assumptions should have been marked with red and surrounded by a ton of exclamation marks because they were that wrong. All right, let's just fast forward one year until we figure that out. So we went ahead, you know, engineering fun. We developed the first um, 
proof of concept. We developed something that was much more efficient than the others. You know, we, we brought down the, the system cost. It was direct drive. It was so cool. It was really amazing. We built the first prototype. Um, you know, just to give some context, the top picture was taken in July 2019. Uh, then we spent roughly six months, um, you know, putting the first one together. Uh, so I demoed the first prototype in Kenya uh, in February 2020. That's when COVID really hit and that caused us a lot of difficulties. We lost access to, to China and our factory and our staff there. Um, but you know, on the on the silver lining, the prototype seemed to have received really good verbal feedback. We were in full sales mode. We don't need to listen to the customers. We know what they want. And here it is exactly, you know, people seem to like it. So we built 10 MVPs, minimal viable products, and we deployed them over the course of 2020, thanks to COVID in a very slow bad, uh, pace. And uh, what we found once we really started talking to the customers, towards December of 2020 is that it was an utter failure. It was not a good product market fit. It was a good product, but not what people needed. We completely disregarded the culture. The culture is that we don't want to run the mill when the sun is shining. I don't want to drop the maze down and come back for it later. I want to meal now, when I'm at the meal. I walk for an hour and I want to see my maze going into the machine. Not the neighbor's maze, not a good friend's maze, not that obnoxious guy from the market. I want my own maze because I spent a year growing it and I'm very personally attached to it. And when people are coming, they are coming at the same time because these meals don't get turned on unless there is a long line of people. And here the speed was just not sufficient. And the utilization, we almost also completely got it wrong. We said, well, they probably would run it eight hours a day because that's what I would do. But what we did not consider is that even diesel meals are barely run for an hour a day. And most meals are facing very low utilization and these rural areas tend to be extremely sparse and uh, low population density. So the utilizations are much, much slower and the unit economics with that collapsed and crumbled. So there we go. We went back to the drawing table and came up with the second version of the meal, what we saw on the, on the video and what we are selling today that, uh, you know, uh, really, really unfortunately had to tackle these issues at the fundamental level and, uh, and uh, resize the motor, uh, had to, increase the, the production rate, the power rating. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to go into more details, but <laughs> uh, had to had to make a lot of changes to create a, a much, much better product market fit. And again, we could have done all that right at the beginning. And you feel like you don't have time, you don't have money to spend a month running around rural Africa and talking to customers. But look at all this waste that you could avoid down the road, which is, I'm guaranteeing you, costing you a whole lot more time and a whole lot more money. So with that, thank you so much for your attention. I want to see if you are open to internships. Uh, my email is silar.axel.com. If you're interested, please feel, feel free to reach out. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to jump into the Q&A session. Thanks, Gilad. That was, uh, that covered everything really. Um, <laughs> so I hope our students have any questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, follow through the Mentimeter, raise your hand, uh, whatever you like. Um, in the meantime, I, I have my own questions, although I think answered a lot of them, um, which is great, which is really great. Um, so, um, Yes, please just send those in whenever. Uh, you don't have to wait till the very end or when I'm finished asking questions. I'm sure you all have them, especially as it pertains directly to all your assessment criteria. Um, and Chilard had a lot of great lessons there from his own experience. <laughs> um, okay, so just touching on um, something you said quite early on, you, you mentioned, um, I mean, there's a big focus on understanding your end user. Um,
but I, un I, I would think that most people would be considering their end user throughout the design process. Um, and I was wondering what kind of recommendations you have for someone trying to get an edge on the competition. How do you innovate above the competition and trying to understand your end user? How do you understand them more deeply? Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. I, you, you sent it over to me previously and I, I, I love the optimism in that, that surely engineers must design with the end consumer in mind. And uh, I'm, I'm just really terrified to see that that is very often not the case. A lot of time, you know, I, I, I mentioned to you before, um and this is this is a saying of uh, a former supervisor of mine is that we train engineers to answer questions and we engineers are really good at solving problems and really good at answering questions but where we are bad at is asking the right questions or finding the right problem and i'm just seeing it time and again uh especially with student teams to be perfectly honest is that the the find a complex problem don't validate it. Don't check whether somebody is actually facing that problem. They just like, hey, that is something that would be cool to solve, and just straight jump straight to the engineering. Just like we have, like look at look at the the top part of that little curve. We're like, okay, uh, problem. Yeah, 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 we boring. We we know what the problem is. The people people need better off grid milling. Yeah, yeah. So jump straight to brushless DC motors, direct drive because that's so much fun. So, you know, I, I think it's very important to, again, go back, go back to the basics, both engineering wise and your customer wise, have direct access. A lot of our competitors, um, I'm just seeing the products that they, they come up with. And, uh, you know, we, we are based in Nairobi, Kenya, and, you know, most of my colleagues are Kenyan. And I show them a video of the product and they just laugh. You know, it's simply, simply so detached from reality um, that it's obvious that they have not, you know, they, it will take them some time to really put the product in the hands of a customer and uh, get that feedback uh, that they are just not realizing how, uh, how far away they are from a, from a product market fit and on the back of a product market fit an organic growth that's essential to all uh, businesses. Thanks, Ilad. And, and on that, actually, I just wanted to ask our students again in the Mentimeter, if you have, uh, if you can, um, I wanted to ask how all of you are approaching innovation. Um, and maybe we can look at that in the end and see if anyone, yeah, what kind of answers we get. Because as Ilad said, uh, many students are not uh, maybe more interested in, in addressing a problem and, and sorting out these cool prob these cool um, design issues rather than uh, really thinking about the end user. So I just wanted to hear a bit about how everyone else is approaching this. Um, and then on this, uh, you mentioned the, the kind of assumption you had about BLDC motors and Khaled in, in the chat asked, in your micro mill you use BLDC motors. Um, but it needs more power. So why don't you use any DC motor? Uh, what was the kind of the edge of the PLDC? Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, Khalid, I, I gotta say, we gotta go back to engineering fundamentals. Why does it use more power? I'm sorry, you're, you're on the call, right? Yeah, Khalid is here. Khalid, would you like to answer that question? I don't know if you can come off uh, mute. Can you ask again? Sorry, I didn't hear it. Sorry, the, 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 my question was, why do you think that a BLDC motor needs more power than a DC motor? Um, I'm actually saying that uh, uh, the reason why I'm saying that uh, a DC motor is actually uh, uh, consumes less power than a BLDC motor. So why, why you actually used it? That was my question. Yeah, so I know again, BLDC going... motor is more efficient. Uh, it may be, uh, it, uh, it is more faster than the NEDC motor. Uh, at, it has the less uh, power loss uh, since we use the brushless, uh, but uh, why actually uh, we didn't use, we don't use nowadays a DC motor for a milling purpose. There was. 
So exactly going back to engineering fundamentals, uh, a brushless DC motor uses less power than a DC motor to drive the same, you know, angular load uh, because it's higher efficiency. So, you know, these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, assumptions are what's, uh, you know, are, are, are keeping back the uh, industry. Um, brush, brushless DC motors uh, having uh, a motor controller also gives you uh, more complete control over the, the machine. Um, DC motors, when you are starting them up without any control electronics, they are drawing a huge inrush current and you normally have to size for that. The brushes need periodic replacement, and that's not something that is very workable in, in rural Africa. Uh, they are creating uh, a large amounts of uh, arcing, aging, all electrical components. So, you know, for a variety of reasons, and brush motors are used by our competitors and are used in the industry. But if you start doing the math and seeing the number of hours the, these machines needs to, to run, uh, you know, you will quickly see that they are not uh, not a viable alternative. And also, for the record, they are less efficient. That means to you know, if you if you look at the machine on a input power output power losses perspective, for the same output power, you have more losses. Therefore, you need to input more power. So they are consuming more power. Okay, I hope that kind of uh, answers the question. Yeah. And I, I think uh, I have a follow up on, uh, with that. Um, so considering Khaled has um, has made this assumption about BLDC motors and DC motor differences, how do you go through your design process and um, really identify and address all of your all of your assumptions that you make? Because something like that wasn't necessarily about the end user. It was about something that he really considered was a, a, a flat uh, engineering principle or design principle. So, how do you work through all of those? Um, the format depends on you know what you're most comfortable with. It can be you know a whiteboarding session where you just kind of sit down with your your friends and team members and kind of uh, state your assumptions explicitly. Uh, it can be in an Excel sheet. It can be you know in a piece of paper, one way or the other. But do state your assumptions and make sure that uh, you know. Um, like like I said at the beginning, engineering first principles that you do not. Um, uh, rely on broad generalizations, but really based on the, the natural truths uh, that are that are in action here. In, in this case, a kind of a, you know now the new magnet versus electric magnet kind of first principle. Um, whichever format you're most comfortable with, do state your assumptions and validate them. Okay, um, then I would make sure everyone as well write those down and try to address. I identify them um, whatever you can. Um, so we have a couple more questions in the chat as well. Uh, one that's kind of uh, uh, big from, from Mika asking, how can I be innovative? That's, I guess, is the, the title of the presentation, right? <laughs> um, again, my, my answer to that is uh, Steve Jobs' famous quote, uh, you know, uh, creativity is just connecting things. So I, I, I think that you are innovative already. You just need to be exposed to the right dot that you can connect in a different way. So, you know, know your technology. If you feel like your engineering fundamentals are not solid enough, make sure to improve them. That will take you, you know, much further in life, uh, just like I, I have, and I've been unhappy with my, with my um, engineering training. Um, know your customer know your industry and once you have those dots laid out in front of you you will see that you will have ideas that others don't and you will inherently by the stochastic nature of humans <laughs> you will approach the problem differently than others and that is where true innovation comes from if the building blocks that you are leaning on are solid Right, and I and I think Silard make a made a great point early on that we have 
a huge wealth of resources on the internet now. Um, and you can tap into those at all times. I, I will be sharing some resources related to um, lean, what was it, lean design engineering? Um, yeah, you call it the lean startup book or, you know, the, more broadly speaking, the lean product development that grew out of it. Sure. Um, so I'll be looking up those books and, and putting all those resources on the follow up um, um, post. Uh, so please look out for those and, and check those out. Um, yeah. Also, this presentation, I'm, I'm happy to share in a PDF format, Sean, if you want to, you know, share it with, with the guys. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Sure. Um, Peace asks a... Uh, a more operation, more logistical question about the micro mill. Um, are there occasions that the mill couldn't operate due to weather changes? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, like all solar systems, there are conditions where you know you just can't operate. Uh, you know, if there is no sun for three days in the rainy season, you have to size for that. So this variable is called level of independence and it is measured as time and basically this shows you um you know how long can your system run with a fully charged battery with no solar input whatsoever so this was one of the one of the key innovations that we made uh, back in uh, in 2019 that people always assumed that uh, rural african customers are you know a german guy designing a product for rural Africans, they are going to assume the rural Africans are like Germans. And Germans sure love reliability and they want 100% dependability. That means that I need a system that can run for three days, even if the sun is not shining, because I cannot live with the fact that I may lose power. Uh, I strongly challenge that view. <laughs> my, my experience. Um, has showed that uh, people sure value, you know, uh, reliability, but uh, they also, uh, you know, really, really like affordability. <laughs> and, you know, having a $2,000 highly reliable system is, uh, is not very uh, user friendly. So what do you need to do to be able to, I'm sorry, I'm just getting a lot of um, background noise. So just disabling that. Uh, so what you need to do to uh, really is, again, know your customers, challenge assumptions, <laughs> and, uh, and accept the fact that, hey, these people living in rural areas are living in such an uncertain environment that they are willing to accept uncertainty if it is financially affordable. So we basically ran tests and we are still running that test that the mill is able to run without solar in its default minimal package for 40 minutes, or it can mill 40 kilograms. Okay, so it's not much. It, it may feel like that, oh, geez, that's, you know, I have, a, I have a cloudy afternoon or I have, you know, nighttime milling and, and I'm out of juice. And that's true. But what we did is like, sure guys, you can buy a second battery for 200 bucks. Do you know how many people took that offer up? We had two out of 100. So, you know, you kind of have to look at the normal distribution of customers and you have to kind of shoot for the middle. And if somebody wants more, you know, sure, do it, offer it. You know, you can buy a second one. We are, we are compatible, it's fully possible, but always know what the mean market demand is, if that kind of makes sense. Thanks, Hilar. And I think you answered this last question. We have to let you go now, but I just wanted to ask this last question that Peace uh, sent is uh, about what the milling capacity is at certain weight load. Um, was that 40 kilograms? Oh, but it actually asks daily. So daily. That's right. So it can run 40 minutes without sunshine, you know, in the middle of the night. On the average day, you know, it depends on how much solar you're putting on it. If you put, you know, 600 watts, you can even in rainy weather, you know, annual average around two hours a day. So that gives you 120 kilograms a day. Sorry. So we went out and, uh, and surveyed diesel mills because again, you know, the, the first assumption that, hey, the World Bank and WFP brought all these amazing reports. I mm -hmm. mean, surely they know what they are talking about. Well, we went out and uh, you know checked the data ourselves. Well, first of all, the data that we really needed was not available, and two, what was you know implied turned out to be absolutely wrong, 
And when we went out and surveyed diesel mills, we found that the average daily capacity that they are milling, and these are again huge systems with you know several horsepowers of power rating, they typically mill 110 kgs a day. So that's what we sized for, and uh, that's how. Again, you know, if you want to mill more, not a problem. You need more batteries, you need more solar, easy peasy, Lego building blocks. Uh, but you know, again, we are not sizing the entire product around uh, that that assumption. So yeah, on in the in the basic version, you can do 120 kgs, but can be updated, you know, if uh, if the demand is there. Thanks, Ilan. And I I assume Peace is probably working on a solar mill. And my all these questions are coming through. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we have to let you go now. We're over time. Um, but I wanted to thank you for coming along um, and answering all these questions. It was really great to listen to all of this. Um, and all the recording will be available online. I'll post some post-event resources as well. Um, so look out for all of that on the CrowdSolve uh, page. It'll The recording will be shared through YouTube as usual. Um, so thanks, Ilard. Um, You don't have to stick around for the end. I'm just going to go through some short feedback surveys for the students uh, for, the, for, for our own benefit. Um, Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you guys, and I will be sending the presentation. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Ilar. Um, Okay, so as usual, we have the short feedback survey. Um, so if you just follow through the QR code, I just like some feedback on how these webinars are going, uh, what you think of them, and how we can improve them. So this will help us improve for the rest of the year and for future years. Um, so as usual, we hope you enjoy them. But, uh, we are completely open to any sort of feedback you might have, positive and negative. Valerie, you're asking me uh, uh, a direct message about joining your CrowdSolve group. Um, sorry, I've been away for the last two way, uh, two days on a strategy uh, session, so I so I haven't been able to address those yet. Um, but I'll be chasing up with the CrowdSolve um, developers today and see if we can we can get you on in your CrowdSolve group. I hope that's okay. Uh, I'll be in touch over email. Um, otherwise, we also have our usual newsletter sign up. So please sign up for that. Uh, we'll also be sharing the newsletter on the website and on CrowdSolve. So um, you can look out for it there. But it's always helpful to get it to get signed up, uh, learn about industry news, some some news stories, and that can kind of last you after the challenge as well. If you want, if you're still interested in the sector. Um, so sign up for that newsletter if you're interested. We only come out quarterly, so we're not going to fill up your inbox. Otherwise, that's the end of the session, and I just wanted to thank you all for coming. Um, we have, I think, a drop-in next week. If you have any questions, um, I'll be available for that hour, and I'll be in touch about any future uh, webinars. I think we've got one more web thematic webinar for the year um, and one more career conversation. We're coming up to the end of our events for the year, so I hope you've enjoyed them. Um, but we ha we'll have some other sporadic things throughout the year. Um, but I'll let you all go now. Thank you for coming. Sorry for going over five minutes. Um, and I'll see you all soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Sorry.